Let me just provide a very brief welcome. I thank you for coming uh, to this event this evening, uh, to this annual Telberg Foundation Global Leaders Forum. I really want to acknowledge United Nations Deputy Secretary General John Eliason, former De Deputy Secretary General. I have seen him a little bit in operation, and I can say I was immediately impressed uh, both by his obvious diplomatic skills, but also by the substance of what drives him. And uh, it's really a, a credit to him that we have these sustainable development goals, which is an enormous achievement uh, for the world. I also want to recognize uh, Carol Gluck, whom I'll turn this over to in a second. Carol has been the indefatigable leader of um, the Committee on Global Thought and uh, the inspiration uh, behind making this uh, the success uh, that it is at Columbia. And to Vishaka Desai, who has joined us uh, from the Asia Society uh, a number of years ago and has played many roles uh, at the university, not least of which uh, is working with Carol and uh, the faculty and the students uh, in creating this thing we call uh, the Committee on Global Thought, uh, which is not self-evident and obvious what it should be, uh, but they've made it into something truly uh, quite wonderful. So we have these young leaders, not uh, the usual kinds of people that we honor at the end of their life for great achievements, but uh, something at the beginning, not people just to promise, people who have uh, and are doing things in the world that are deeply admirable, uh, for which we should be incredibly grateful, and we get to listen to them and uh, honor them. And the last thing I would say uh, that, as I understand the Telberg Foundation and its mission, and uh, the uh, Jan Eliasson, the Committee on Global Thought, uh, we're all trying to figure out really what roles institutions can play in the world. It's just a great, great puzzle. Because we all know that the problems are massive, and we all know that the traditional institutions that we call upon to deal with these are hampered for any number of reasons. Uh, and so we're trying to invent, it seems to me, a new global system of governance and uh, policy and effects at, at the same time that we're recognizing these great problems. So I view tonight as uh, one of these little moments um, when you find out that there are people who have done incredible, are doing incredible things, uh, sort of on their own and can make it into something uh, really quite special. And we just can't do uh, enough of this in the world. And, and universities should be places not only that honor uh, individuals like this, but we both foster it and do everything we can to, to try to help. Thanks very much. Carol. Well, I'd like to add my welcome to all of you, to the welcome of President Bollinger, this time on behalf of the Committee on Global Thought. Uh, we're very happy to be able to co-sponsor this event with the World Leaders Forum and with, of course, the Talberg Foundation. The idea of celebrating these incredible global leaders who do so much good and also do so much to inspire the rest of us to try to do Good. So we thank them for their global leadership, and I'd also like to thank them on behalf of the Committee on Global Thought for leading two student workshops tomorrow. Um, we organized them. There are 90, 90 graduate students from 10 schools across the university and more than 50 undergraduates from all four undergraduate schools. And these two workshops sold out in two hours. We had to change the place and we had to turn people away, which I think is a sign of the interest among students in global things and also their hopes to follow in your incredible footsteps. 
Now, among these students are 25 students in the master's program in global thought who come from around the world with diverse backgrounds, and they all come equipped with hope and ambition. And their ambition is to contribute to making the world a better place. And in the undergraduate workshop, you will have the members of our undergraduate committee on global thought and many of their colleagues who are interested in their work. Under President Bollinger's guidance, Columbia has become a truly global university, and you really feel it when you speak to the students. And their response to your generosity in leading their workshops is an indication of that. And I also, like President Bollinger, would like to thank Vishaka Desai, who, as the vice chair of the Committee on Global Thought, brought the Taubert Foundation here today. She was a juror for this year's Global Leadership Award, and she's an invaluable Columbia person. When I was reading the Talberg Foundation information, I was really struck by how many of the same words and same missions uh, that the foundation has, and they share with the CGT, or I should say we share with you, because I'm sure you were there first. <laughs> uh, but it, it was heartwarming to me to think that it's, we all have a similar idea uh, the mission of the CGT, when it was found, the Committee on Global Thought, was founded by President Bollinger in 2006. And it, it was his vision, which we are trying still to implement and make real. And when I read in the Talberg uh, brochure about Talberg is going to be a platform, it's going to be a network for, a, and I quote, an ever-widening global as possible conversation. And I thought, yes. That's what we're trying to do, too. The Committee on Global Thought reaches across the university, across the city, and around the world. And our goal is to think across scholarly disciplines, across national borders, and outside that box we all talk about of conventional categories to better understand and also improve the world in which we now live give you one example so from our current research project called Thoughts on a Changing World, which is, I think, quite true to the tradition both of the Talberg Foundation and of Global Columbia. The first topic in the first phase of this research project, which is a multi-year transnational project, the first topic is called Youth in a Changing World, and I think it's worth telling you how that happened. We chose the subject as a result of a global conversation in 10 cities with nine with panels in nine of Columbia's global centers. And it turned out that in all 10 cities, from Beijing to Rio, everyone said, we are most concerned about the future of youth. Youth and technology, youth and work, youth and identity, youth and civic participation. And so we crowdsourced our research project. We globally came to that conclusion. And now as we embark on it, we are continuing to do it in a global conversational way, acting as a network and a platform. And I hope that that is in the Talberg Foundation spirit as well as in that of the Committee on Global Thought. So I think you can see why the Committee on Global Thought is both honored and grateful to have you here at Columbia and to celebrate these amazing global leaders who are making every effort and succeeding in doing real good and real work in the world. It's now my pleasure to introduce Alan Soga, Stoga, who is the chairman of the Talberg Foundation, and from what I understand, the driving force behind the present shape of the Leadership Awards. Thank you, Carol, for the introduction. Thank you, President Bollinger. This feels like home. We may not leave. Uh, I am Alan Stoga. I am chairman of the Telberg Foundation. Um, what I'd like to do in a few minutes is a couple things. First, I'd like to tell you who the Telberg Foundation is and what we want to be. Our backstory starts about 35 years ago. Uh, our founder, a Swedish businessman named Bu Ekman, uh, was one of Volvo's senior executives. 
And Boo was an extraordinary person. Boo understood that if you talk to yourself long enough, you will know nothing. Uh, and he realized that that's what Swedish business was doing. They were talking to themselves. Um, they were tremendously successful, but Boo understood that could not possibly last unless he broadened out the conversation. So 35 years ago, in the little town, a gorgeous little town called Telberg, uh, which you pronounce much better than I do, by the way, um, which is in middle Sweden, Boo convened a conversation. 30 people, they were all men at that time, uh, 20 businessmen, 10 academics, uh, experts in industrial organization, experts in Japan, experts in all sorts of things, and they started talking. Um, and that's where Telberg comes from. It eventually was institutionalized after a fashion, um, and we're still talking. We fundamentally believe uh, that if you convene the right people in the right place to talk about the right things, you're going to make progress. But it's important that they're not the same people. They're not the same places. There are no borders in information anymore, and there can't be any borders in conversation. So we try to do, uh, as we talk about things like climate change, uh, like mass migration, the impact of uh, new technologies on society, the growing conflict between globalization and economic uh, nationalism, we want our, our conversations to have uh, three characteristics. Now, first, uh, and my colleague Tom Cummings, who you'll meet in a moment, mentioned this today as we met all day, we're actually looking for questions, not answers. We actually think we're in the business of trying to find better questions because most of the questions being asked seem to be the wrong ones. Um, second, I'm a firm believer, I'm not much in the Bible, but I'm a firm believer in Noah's Ark. Uh, what you want in a good conversation is two of lots of different kinds of things. So if you want to talk about unemployment, don't bring 30 economists, uh, bring two economists and two artists and a couple of poets. Uh, it's that mix that creates a uh, great conversation. Uh, we had an example a couple years ago. We convened a conversation at CERN outside Geneva at the Large Hadron Collider. And it was two days talking about evolution. And it was evolution of the universe, of the planet, of social organizations, of mankind. And at the end of it, a Nobel physicist comes up to me and he says, as they always do at the end of, of these meetings, best meeting I've ever been at. Now, if you're the host, you're not supposed to say, why? I said, why? And he said, I go to, I'm, I'm an academic. What I do is go to conferences for a living. Um, I give papers, but it, and I'm the expert. But at this con first conference I've been at, first workshop I've been at, that I could be stupid. I said, what does that mean? I could ask questions. I wasn't just answering questions. I wasn't just telling people my theories. I was talking to artists about evolution. I was talking to economists about mankind. So we believe in the sort of Noah's Ark of, of, of conversations. Thirdly, as I said, we're borderless. We believe in pitching our tent uh, wherever it makes most sense. So if you want to understand migration, go to Lesbos, Greece, which we did two years ago, and have the conversation there. Um, you want to understand climate change, go up in the ice sheet in northern Greenland, spend some time with, with the scientists drilling ice core, you'll have a better idea. Uh, if you want to understand the impact of technology and evolving technology on science, um, go up to Kendall Square uh, and, and talk to great scientists. Um, go to the Large Hadron Collider and, and, and in, in the context of great science, um, you're going to learn something. And frankly, that's why we're here today. If you want to have a conversation about global leadership, where else should you go except to Columbia uh, and to the Committee on Global Thought? So that's why we're here, and thank you very much for hosting us. Tonight, our program has two anchor points. And of course, they're going to be conversations, not presentations. We're not really good on presentation. Um, the first will be a conversation between uh, Vishaka Desai and, and Jan Eliasson. And I'm sure that I can't possibly add anything to what you already know about Vishaka. She is the real force of nature in this room, not me. Um, but what she has taught us for three years as we work together on this project is what the word global really means. Every time we wander off in the wrong direction, we get a reminder. It has to be global. You have to think globally. You can't let that word disappear or that concept disappear. Thank you for that. Uh, Jan Eliasson, uh, who most of you probably don't know, 
uh, is simply one of the most successful and most committed international diplomats of our era. Uh, he has a long resume. Uh, he was most recently the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, before that, he had been the uh, President of the UN General Assembly. He had been Foreign Minister of Sweden. He had been Ambassador. And with, I don't know what hat you were wearing when you did that, but he negotiated uh, in the Iran-Iraq War, he negotiated in the Balkans, he had negotiated throughout African conflict situations. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, and it's something I've learned from you, Jan, this is a dark world. It's a world where lots of things are going wrong. And I once asked Jan, how do you get up every day? And he says, because I have to, because somebody's got to get up every day. You've got to do it. So he taught me about optimism, and that a great leader has to be optimistic, has to have values, has to be courageous, and has to get up every morning. Uh, so Vishaka and Jan are going to talk a bit about the world, uh, a world that is global, but doesn't seem to want to stay global. And, and that balance between what, what we know has to be and, 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 and what it seems to want to be. Uh, the second part of our program uh, will, will also be a conversation. Uh, among this year's Telberg Global Leaders. Tonight you'll meet four people, plus my colleague. Rodrigo Rubido Alonso, an architect, co-founder, and executive director of Instituto LS, now I have to see, based in Santos, Brazil, that is dedicated to participative leadership, community mobilization, and community building. Rebecca Heller, the director and co-founder of the International Refugee Assistance uh, pro project, IRAP, which is headquartered in New York, and I suspect cell phones around the world, uh, and operates globally, which organizes lawyers and law students to develop and enforce legal and human rights for refugees and displaced persons. Fiorenzo Ominato, the Frank Doble Professor of Engineering and a Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Tufts University, who has pioneered the use of silk as material platform for advanced technology with application in photonics, optoelectronics, and nanotechnology. It's really cool stuff. Um, and Bright Simons, technology innovator, development activist, and social entrepreneur based in Ghana, whose work challenges the received wisdom about social and economic development strategies and programs in Africa, but, but well beyond Africa. My colleague on the Telberg board, Tom Cummings, We'll explore with these leaders how they are working to affect dramatic, positive change in the complicated world that Jan and Vishaka are going to describe. Before we get to these conversations, I, I, I want to introduce what we're trying to do in the leadership space. Conventional wisdom today is that leadership is in short supply. We believe that conventional wisdom is wrong. We may be more than a bit short, particularly in this country at this moment, in political leadership, um, but we firmly believe that there are many individuals with vision, with talent, courage, and values in many spaces and many places who are hard at work to change the world for the better. The Telberg Foundation is committed to finding these leaders, honoring them, building a network among them, and in doing so, encouraging others to follow their examples. The four leaders that we're going to listen to and honor tonight were selected by an international jury of nine women and men from around the world, including Vishaka. They reviewed more than 200 nominations from 50 countries, and these were business people, they were uh, political leaders, they were social activists, entrepreneurs, religious leaders, uh, and all of those nominations were done by ordinary people. The way our, our process is entirely online, all of you should nominate people next year. The only people on the planet Earth that cannot nominate are the nine or 10 judges uh, because we don't want conflicts. The leaders you're going to meet, I think, after you listen to them for a little bit, you will agree that the jury got it right once again. I think we're, we, we've done this three years in a row. We're three and oh, and, um, and I think that's a good start. And now it is my honor and, and extraordinary privilege to introduce two dear friends, Vishaka Desai and Jana Wiesen. Please. As Alan mentioned, you've, you have so many different experiences 
in your 40 plus year of amazing career. I could ask you about UN, I'm not going to do that. I could ask you about all the different conflicts you have resolved, we're not going to do that either. But to really kind of get at this question of the global condition that we are in today, you have seen everything. And at the same time, we recognize that today, even the word global seems to be under attack. Attack from many different forces. Whether it's so-called nationalism, populism, ethnic strife. How do you think about that notion of the word global under attack, and at the same time, trying to find a new path? that brings you, because you're a committed globalist, yeah. and to find a new path. What is that new path? Well, let me start with uh, Alan's uh, recognition of me as an optimist. Uh, I force myself to be an optimist, but I think I want to qualify it and say that in today's world, I'm a worried optimist. and. Uh, Having served in the United Nations for many years, um, the last five years, I think the United Nations is a reflection of two things. It's a, a mirror of the world as it is, and it's not a pretty place, but it's also a mirror of the world as it should be. And I don't think we should ever forget that, that we have the direction given in the UN Charter and by the values that Tilbury stands for and you at your university stand for, uh, and that we must never give up. It's uh, so crucial, not least among you young people, to realize that nobody can do everything, but that everything, everybody can do something. And we have different roles. I think in today's world with the challenges that we have ahead of us, we need to uh, see that there is, a, I think, a great need to work across borders. Yes, these things are pretty tricky. Uh, to work across borders, uh, both in terms of, uh, in my area in the United Nations, peace and security, development and human rights. There's no peace without development, no development without uh, peace, and there is none of the above without respect to human rights. But also, and I thank President Bollinger for that, that the universities and all other actors, the private sector, civil society, uh, you and me and all of us need to be mobilizing now to stand up for these common values. And we can only do it if we mobilize horizontally. Uh, there is too much, far too much of vertical organization, far too much of silos. Of course, we have to be extremely good in our silos and vertical. But when we want to solve problems in the world, we better go horizontal. And by that, I don't mean go to sleep, by the way. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that we, 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 there is a need to make sure that there is no immediate contradiction between the global, the national, and the local. And I think we need a more passionate story about the global dimension. I usually say uh, about passion, by the way, that without passion, nothing happens in life. But I also think that without compassion, the wrong things happen. And we need to have a more driving, compassionate story, a narrative about the global dimension. I mean, I think that in itself is one of the issues that you have talked about. And that is that when we use the word global, it feels very abstracted. It feels, as my husband says, global schmobel, you know. I, it, it doesn't really jump out. It's a very American thing, what can I tell you? Uh, but that it, whereas when we think about religion, when we think about ethnic strife, when we think about even nationalism, populism as it's used today, not always how it's used, there's certain emotion that's attached to it. You have lived that idea of global and you're passionate about it. So how do we bring that notion of passion and make it less abstracted to people so they feel like they can see themselves in it? Yeah. And you began very early with this. 
Well, first of all, I think we shouldn't have a contradiction uh, between national and international. In fact, uh, I said at an early discussion today, I'm very patriotic about my own country. Uh, and I don't want uh, people on the, particularly the right wing in Europe, in my country, to steal my pride in my own country. I'm a, I'm a true patriot. But I'm also an internationalist. And one should understand that, in fact, the word identity, if you ask yourself how often do you use the word identity, you probably use that word very often, but have, how often do you use it in terms of plural? I think we should accept that identities, identity is much better in plural than in singular. I'm a Swede, I'm European, I'm a world citizen, and you can go all, all across the field. And I think that sense of, of having a broader view that you don't see a contradiction between what you do at home and what you do uh, internationally is something we, we have to uh, achieve. And where did it begin for you? How did you get oh, you there? Want, you want to go back to... <laughs> to uh, we are both American Field Service students. Uh, 17 years old, we went to the uh, United States. He was some uh, years I was, before uh, me. I but... was a party guy. <laughs> I was, uh, I was, we went on a bus tour around the States, and, and there were two girls quarreling in front of me. I was in the back seat to get some sleep after the party from the night before, you know, age 18. And they spoke so much. There was a Greek girl and a Turkish girl. They quarreled about, this, about Cyprus. And I had to listen to it like you have to listen to uh, mobile phone conversations on the train or on the bus. And in the end, I, I got tired of this 20-minute uh, quarrel between the two. So I leaned over to them and said, well, now I'll listen to you for so long. But I think I have a solution for you for Cyprus. So I suggested that the Turkish minority would have more minority rights, be assured rights in the parliament and maybe in the government. And that's how you could probably solve this. Otherwise, there would be a Greek Cypriot majority running the country forever. And they looked at me and said, oh, oh, you should work at the United Nations. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it started. But we don't have too much time. I think we were promised. We were asked to do the optimist side. I mean, right. the, worries, the worries are so, I don't need to talk about that. I spent a lot of time working on the nuclear risks involved in uh, the Korean situation. I'm chair of Stockholm International Peace Research, Research Institute. We have, of course, the facts that conflicts now turn out even more difficult than ever before, because they easily turn into proxy wars, Syria. We have the climate change, which is an existential issue which we must take seriously. The word responsibility is perhaps the most important word for that. So you can go along, and also this division of us and, and them, and, uh, and the uh, sort of hesitation about everybody's equal worth. All this is very worrying, but hope, just four words for hope from me, and you may have your view on this. Uh, one, the biggest hope is women. Women's full emancipation empowerment will come soon. It is, has to come, it will come. It's going to be the greatest positive news in the world. For the first time in history, this will happen. And if you, particularly women, feel that it's going slowly and people start to mobilize against it, that's a sign that it's getting serious. And the big thing is for this to become not only a question of emancipation of women, but emancipation of man, men and women together. It's going to be the biggest improvement qualitatively in the world. Secondly, young people, you here. I think we should not only think, we in my generation, about what we can do for youth, which we should do, of course, but we should also think what we can do with youth, with youth. And we are in a hurry to get you in on the decision-making processes, the del deliberations in all fora. And I think there is a tremendous force in that. Thirdly, knowledge, universities, scientific community. If we are to, I'm very glad you mentioned the sustainable development goals, Lee. Uh, if, we, if these are to become a reality, before 2030, we need to really get the scientific community on board for health, climate, transport, energy, everything. And the last thing that I really want to bring out is international cooperation. The most important word in the world today is together, with, at the side of responsibility. Together. And above all, I think we, in today's world, have a huge deficit of dialogue and diplomacy. Russians and Soviet diplomats are called back, reducing their presence. State Department evidently is not fully, fully uh, 
uh, fully full, uh, filled Thir with... Well, the, it's actually 30% yeah. reduction, uh, this and plan. And we have very little dialogue across uh, lines like North Korea and, and United States. It goes all over the same. This dialogue deficit is extremely dangerous. And I think with you here, think about the enormous power in preventive diplomacy in a creative diplomacy. So these are the four hope factors that make me, in the end, optimists, maybe without the restriction of worried. <laughs> so, over to you. I, it seems to me that when you talk about being a worried optimist, when you start talking about your optimism, I sense that the worry kind of recedes yeah. and you get very excited. So if you were to think about new kind of leadership as you, I mean, you've seen many, many leaders and you have to be very diplomatic when you were at the UN. What characteristics have you found in this new world context that you think are particularly important in a leader? And what are the characteristics that you think are really a problem when you see it in a leader? I was uh, three years in the Navy of Sweden and I had a situation where our ship was in great danger. And I looked at the uh, bridge where I was standing after this storm, and I looked at the striped guys there with the, who were there on the bridge. But the ones that had saved us in that situation were, was the guys in the machine room with their tattoos and hurt by the thrown between the engines. And I went down to thank them. And that has characterized at least my way of working, that you realize that you have your own role, but you have to work together with others and give them their responsibility. And then I always appreciate when there is a sense of very great, great degree of openness. There is a story, a fairy, fairy tale author by the name of A.C. Anderson. He has written this fantastic fairy tale about the emperor without clothes and the little boy who says that he's naked. We need to have people who say, come back to some basic issues and honestly raise the problems and by that heighten the, the, the dialogue. And then, I, of course, I think you should, since you are in, your, in these formative years, is to be extremely good in what you're studying, what you're doing. But also understand that your life will be so much more interesting and you will be much more of a problem solver if you open the doors to others who see the problem from different other directions. It's not only a good way to get the solutions, it's also more fun. Because when you see it from different angles, you get a much greater sense of community and the realization that you have to be a team in the end to do it. So these are some of the things that I'm thinking about. But then also, there should be an element of, um, I was about to say, fun. I want my staff to bounce to work. That's, maybe that's too much to ask for. <laughs> But you know that they know that it's going to be something that we have together and that we will solve together. And when I have that sense that they run with the ball, I go home and as my daughter Anna knows, I fall asleep within seconds. I'm glad <laughs> she's a graduate of Columbia, by the way. Uh, and I, I think the, the fact that we have, the world is such a troubled place, but we got to make sure that we make it a place where we see challenges rather than problems and perils. So was this idea of fun there even 40 years ago for you? Uh, the idea of fun. No, no, that was... Uh, it's a little later, basically. right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to open it up. We just have time for a few questions before we go to the next panel. So if you have an urgent question, especially for Jan, please raise your hand, identify, and come to the microphone. You can't be that shy. Come on. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm interested in, um, uh, you said the, the greatest hope is in women. Can you expand on that a little? What, what do we have to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, and also I, young people, right? What do you have to do? No, but it, it's so obvious it that the, it's so obvious that the voices of women are not heard in so many contexts. I have mediated in six conflicts, from Iran, Iraq to Darfur, uh, and no, never have I have seen a woman in the uh, delegation on the other side. 
So we have resolution 1325 in the UN, but it has, it's far too slow there. But when I have been planning the negotiations in different situations, I've always made sure that in my delegation are women and that, that I'm inviting women to the uh, negotiations. And when they come, you get a much more hands-on, uh, oriented to the field, to the home, to the family approach, which really adds that passion that you need to bring into the, the negotiations. But I think generally also it's a tremendously untapped resource, apart from the human dignity, which is not uh, uh, respected. I mean, it simply says, both in the UN Charter and in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that we're all born free and equal. And we have to live up to that. And, and I think it's also, apropos of being more fun, uh, that it's going to be a vitalizing force. And it is going to happen. But I think it's important that also men are seeing that as a liberation of man, not as women only. I could give you many examples how, how helpful it is to see the perspective from the women. And it, it is coming. Uh, when I go to Rwanda, uh, more women than men in the parliament. If I go to West Africa, uh, as many of my African friends know, some over here, they are dominating the trade in, in their countries. If you go look at the number of presidents, women in Africa and Asia, it's all over the place, Latin America. So it is coming, and it's going to be a great and positive force. Thank you. Thank you. And we cannot take any more, so just the two more. But brief questions, yes? Hi, thank you both. Um, I just want to know uh, briefly about, um, if you could talk a little bit about diversity, especially with organizations based in Northern Europe and areas like Sweden that are not typically um, heterogeneous communities. And also I wanted to know, when you say uh, work across, across borders, it feels a little bit generic to me, so I was wondering if you could give a little bit more in-depth examples of like what that means in terms of action-based um, performances. Thank you. Well, by borders, I don't mean uh, only uh, geographic borders. I also mean uh, borders within society, the different horizontal co um, combinations you can have with the different actors, governments, parliaments, by the way, very important, uh, private sector, uh, universities, science world, civil society. But I, I think the, the, uh, the, the dynamics that comes from from that border crossing is absolutely crucial. But I think the most important, most urgent issue to handle in that perspective is the migration and refugee issues. We have now a situation in the world with 244 million migrants, 65 million refugees. If we don't turn the narrative into, from, from a very negative narrative, in Europe, this is seen as a problem and peril, not as a potential or a possibility. If we don't see this as a historic turning point where we need at least to make that new narrative neutral, if not completely positive, because it is a bit of a challenge for any society. But if we don't see, for instance, what IMF and OECD has proven, that it is a great uh, addition to, to the GMP in most countries to have the migration, it's also, for the demographic uh, development, crucial. We would have negative population growth in Western Europe without the migration. If you look at the remittances from the migrants, you will t see that the remittances in value are three times the official development assistance in the world. So what that means for the villages in Sri Lanka, Philippines, and so forth, is incredibly important. And lastly, we all have to ask ourselves now, do we want to go the direction of diversity or exclusion. This is a crucial situation which we will find ourselves. You in the, in the United States, in Europe, and that debate has to come to, to, in my view, to the conclusion that we we have this irresistible force of international cooperation getting more and more serious. And in my own country, I have given a speech at National Day a couple of years, uh, year, years ago, and they asked me to speak about Sweden and the world. And they wanted me to speak about Dag Hammarskjöld, the Rolf Palme, Count Bernadotte, and so forth. I did so. But then I insisted to have a second part. I've only told half the story. Sweden and the world, yes. But we also have to think that the world is in Sweden. With ideas, with products, and with people. And that's when you have a complete picture of this approach of you know, 
cross, working across borders, that you also realize that the migration issue is actually basically now growingly an integration issue. Last question. Hi. Uh, so in speaking to your career as a serial diplomat, what characteristic of your temperament do you think has contributed most <laughs> So you being a successful conflict, you know, negotiator, or uh, for you to be <laughs> successful in resolving conflict? Be careful, conflict. that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. I, first of all, I have to hide my passion. <laughs> okay. So you've got to be controlled and listen. But I, I, I want to say to you, I want to share with you four reasons, in very brief terms, four reasons to fail or to succeed in negotiations, mediation. And if you go very far, if you succeed in life, but that's perhaps too presumptuous. First of all, respect for the word. The word, collect words, no five, six synonyms. Sit at the talks realizing that you can change the wording, change the paragraphs without losing the substance, and then you get it through. Sustainable Development Goals negotiation was that. Respect for the word. I would say even love for the word. Collect words, I say to my children and grandchildren. Secondly, the art of timing. Don't do things too late. But equally seriously, don't do them too early. Analyze timing in anything you want to achieve. When is the right time? And who should be helpful in the process? Third reason is cultural sensitivity. One time in Tehran, I made a mistake, got tired and said, oh, uh, let's break up. And this was translated into Farsi. <laughs> that I was going to leave and it was over, so the foreign minister on the side got very upset. And he said, well, if you don't want to negotiate, what, what do you want to do? And then I said something which, to begin with, was disastrous, but then turned, up, turned out to be lucky strike. I want to go to your famous carpet museum. <laughs> when you really ask me what I want to do. So I went to that museum, and afterwards they pointed to me, he's my friend because they had recognized that this guy from the North Pole, practically, was interested in the way the carpets, the, the colors, the, the patterns, and how they were done by their grandparents who, as child labor, had done that. So it was just the cultural sensitivity, which I think is a, a great, Im important factor. And last thing, very importantly, and now looking back at my life in diplomacy, personal relations, that you instill trust I can't expect sympathy from sitting with Saddam Hussein, which I did 28 hours altogether, but respect that they know that you're truthful and that they can trust the kind of communication that you have. So with those four, uh, four, four conclusions about success or failure, maybe that could be answered to your question. Thank you. Thank you. So, Please join me in giving a big hand to Jan. Thank you. And thank you. Now, with the Global Leaders video. It's about pragmatic driven dreams. I think the, the more this context of application of natural resources becomes front and center, the better we're going to do. And I think it's an awareness that has to leave the scientific world. It has to go into everyday conversation and it has to go beyond the imagination of that wouldn't it be great if the world were all sustainable? Yes, it would be, but you, you really do need to have the small little pieces that then build up to this end result. The art of, of architecture, it's not for the architects to tell people how they should live, but it's how to, to understand people, how to listen to people, 
But in terms of leadership, one thing it's it's realizing the the knowledge, the wisdom, and the power of those who you are leading. The leader today really needs this openness to to listen and to build it together with people. This is for me a, a key ability for, for for leadership today is to understand uh, the richness of the wisdom of the others. It seemed obvious to me that um, if millions of refugees all over the world were going through a really complicated legal system um, and that their lives depended on the outcome, that someone would have suggested that they have lawyers. My whole philosophy of like global social change is that effective work does not divide the action from the messaging and the influence. Like we refer to it as airport weekend internally. Turnout against the travel ban, I think, was was actually a perfect example of how activism has to meld with influence and the communications piece and the symbolism piece um, in order to make like really effective, long-lasting change. To my mind, we need a new values-driven leadership who concern themselves about the impact of technology on the political economy, and that is the kind of leader I want to become. But in addition to that, you can enrich the broader ecosystem by helping others who are primarily accountable for their vocations to do better. And that's the way I see my role. The only thing worth pondering about, worth pursuing, worth exploring, is the human heart in conflict with itself. It's our own personal struggles to define our place and our legacy in this battle. And therefore, our personal leadership journey really is our struggle to deal with our inner contradictions. To me, that is the mark and the height. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tom Cummings, and I am very delighted to be here, and I want to give a special thanks to, to President Bollinger and, and to Carol Gluck, who, who just spoke. And I wanted to just make sure that if, if we're here on behalf of the Committee on Global Thought, that maybe the Talberg Foundation is here f for, the, for the group on global action a little bit. So we find this way that we are working together to create another way of not only thinking about the world, but engaging with the world. And for me, it really starts by trying to understand just as we heard from uh, Jan Eliasson and, and Vishaka, that we're in a world where we're going to have to take into consideration some new ways of doing things. That doesn't mean we can't learn from Jan Eliasson's experience, but um, we're going to be learning more from the future, perhaps, than from the past as we go forward. The Talberg leaders, now the Eliasson global leaders, are really uh, a remarkable group of people, and I want to get them up on the stage very, very quickly here. I think that what's characteristic of me for them is that they're not only changing our perspective on how we look at some of the most challenging issues that we face, as Alan Stoga said, but they're changing our conception of, of what we need to be doing. And that, that difference is subtle but important. It's also interesting to see that the selection of this group of people starts with their significance in their work. I don't know if you know, in, in, in my life, the world seems to have been divided over the years from people either saying, oh, or oh. And when they say, oh, then I really know something is happening. I really know that something has shifted. And each of these people in their own way has broken through on our conception of what it is that we need to do in different fields, in different perspectives. I think it's important that they all are known for their significance, but our hope is that they become known for their, that they become prominent, that, that through this work, not only as Alan Stoga said, they connect with each other, uh, but they find these remarkable ways to really develop a next generation way of, of doing something, and I'll describe what those somethings are in a minute, that transforms 
what, how we think, what we do, where we go in the world, and the perspectives that we ourselves will take. Now, I know that there are a lot of folks in the, in the room who are graduate students, right? Raise your hand if you're a graduate student, just so we know who you are, good. And it was not too long ago that this group of people were also graduate students. So I just want you to know that uh, we want to have you see that they, we still call them young leaders, whatever age they are. They're young in spirit as well. So let's start, um, as Alan mentioned all of them, and I, we were going to have a film. Maybe we'll see the film at the end. Um, I'm going to ask uh, each of them to come up here. We're going to be on the panel. We're going to have a few minutes of conversation. Then I'm going to see people running to the microphones and asking great questions. And then we'll, uh, we'll conclude. And I'll hand it back to, to Vishaka. So first one up, and whom I'd like to invite, and uh, you know, in the theater, we always applaud before they speak, so I think that's a good thing to do. Um, <clears throat> Rodrigo uh, Rubido, uh, please uh, come up, and Rodrigo. Rodrigo's going to help us understand why architects may not be looking at the world in the right way, but he has a group of architects who have taken a really different tack. Um, Rebecca Heller. Some of you may know Rebecca. Uh, she's uh, traveled all the way from Brooklyn, she said. Um, IRAP is her organization, and uh, Alan has already described the work that she's doing. And I think we really want to dig into understanding how in such a short amount of time Rebecca has managed to, or Becca as she likes to be called, uh, made a difference in a very challenging political environment with a very challenging political topic. Um, Fiorenzo Omanetto. He won't say to you the future is plastics, but he will say the future is silkworms. And you'll hear why in a moment. And Bright Simons. And Bright himself is responsible as well for the creation of a couple of institutions, Imani and N Pedigree. And again, we'll hear more from him. I think from what I've done in interviewing them already, in the, in the case of Bright, I'd say your parents named you right. So good. I'm just going to take a seat here, and we'll get started. So are you ready? Yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've asked each of them to consider who are they, what are they doing, what do they know now that they didn't know when they started? So what do they really know now? And what are the questions that they're holding now as they take the next step in what they're doing? So, um, Rodrigo, should we? So I personally said he wasn't ready. You're making oh, you said you were not ready. Then, <laughs> then I'm going to start with Bright. No, this is, this is a conversation. Bright, are you ready? I'm perfect. OK, yes. go for it. So uh, I'm a social entrepreneur. So I spent a lot of my life um, in Ghana. And I started the work that I do currently uh, for a position of anger. Not many of you may be aware, but um, every day, the number of people that die from complications related to fake or substandard medicines is equivalent to the number of people in two jumbo jets. One uh, very famous um, public official in Nigeria, unfortunately now dead, um, has described it as the worst form of terrorism unknown to the majority of the world. So think of it, two jumbo jets of people every day die from complications related to fake and substandard medicines. And I thought that was just something that made me quite angry. So that is how I started. And we wanted a solution that could be ubiquitous enough. And that solution was to build a system for validating the quality of medicines using SMS. 
Uh, eventually, we learned that it was a much more complicated problem. You know, just knowing um, as a consumer whether the medicine you're about to take is genuine or not is a great thing, but it doesn't go deep enough to uproot the problem. And the difference between us social entrepreneurs and commercial entrepreneurs is that we do want to end the problem. We don't want a paycheck forever solving the same problem over and over again. So we decided to do what we do now, which is build an internet of trust. And to build an internet of trust means that we connect all the stakeholders within the supply chain, from manufacturers, regulators, et cetera, using different technologies, and also to expand horizontally beyond medicines um, into cosmetics, automotive, and the rest. And the one thing that we found, and that wasn't too apparent to begin with, um, I'll summarize it using a quote by Carl Sagan, the famous Carl Sagan, uh, who said, if you want to build uh, an omelet from scratch, you first have to invent the universe. So we learned that you know, if we really wanted to build a supply chain founded on trust, then we had to implement a series of schemes that connected multiple actors together. And that is what makes our technology, in a way, quite different from the way that technology nowadays is presented to the world. And what do you know now that you didn't know when you started? That technology is not merely the intervention. It's also the philosophy and the ideology that makes that intervention cause less harm and do real good. So it goes beyond the actual intervention to the set of philosophies and ideologies surrounding that technology, which gives us its true potency. And that is why we are now going beyond simply providing technology to consumers to check whether a product is genuine or not, right. and actually injecting trust into the entire ecosystem, the entire supply chain, so to speak. And the question you're facing at the moment? The one question we are facing is to what extent do we replace parts of the ecosystem that is inherently corrupt? So we have, you, for instance, to give a very easy example, we do have pharmacists that are sworn to protect lives that are still selling fake medicines. Right. Yet we know that the best good we can do or the greatest good we can do is to improve the trust between patients and health workers, not to seek to replace health workers. But at the same time, people are inherently corrupt. They are inherently corrupt. So how do we continue to propel this theory of change that we need to activate trust within the ecosystem right. while at the same time fighting enemies? In better comments, there are enemies, vested interests that are opposed to the work we do, and some of these people are sworn to protect lives. So that's Thank one you, Brian. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, can we, I'll just bounce around here. Um, Rebecca. I make omelets every morning for my kid <laughs> uh, who thinks they're the universe. Um, I'm Becca, I, but, you know, who am I? I? I don't even, I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, I, uh, I'm the co-founder and director of the International Refugee Assistance Project, um, which, believes that refugees should have rights and that they really don't have any now. The um, global framework that we use to process refugees has not been updated since 1951. Um, it's wildly outdated. It doesn't include people fleeing from conflict. So technically, most people fleeing from Syria are not actually refugees and thus have no rights. Um, it doesn't protect anyone fleeing from climate change, which I think that mass displacement as a result of climate change is the major effect of climate change that we'll all see in our lifetimes, and we're not prepared for that. So we started organizing lawyers and law students to try to fight back. Um, and to say, how can institutions better protect the rights of refugees? And then as lawyers and law students, how can, well, first as law students and then as lawyers for most of us who pass the bar exam, um, how can we enforce that? And um, a, a thing that I've been thinking about this year, it's, it's both a thing I've learned and a question that I have. I think, you know, for us, we were always like, I'm a very um, partisan person, but our organization is a very nonpartisan organization uh, because we feel that refugees shouldn't be a political issue. Unfortunately, in the last few years, they've been hyper politicized both in the US and in Europe. Um, and I've never really thought of lawyers as great like movement builders. Um, or great activists. I thought our role was more of like a technical behind the scenes role. Um, and then on January 27th, when the travel ban slash Muslim ban came down from President Trump, we put out a call to our network and said everyone should go to the airport because there's going to be 
thousands of people who are mid-air, who when they took off from wherever they were coming from had permission to land in the US and will land as undocumented immigrants or non-immigrants essentially, and no one will know, knows what will happen to them. Um, and thousands of lawyers all over the country on a very, very cold January day like went to airports and in the end we were able to get 2,100 people released um, from airports that were being turned into black sites. Um, Bravo. So I think the, the takeaway for me from that was that like you, you have a lot of tools in your toolbox and you can use them in really surprising ways, often in the face of the most adversity possible. And the big question that I'm wrestling with is like, I'm tired. Like I think everyone is tired uh, and we're only, and I'm saying this like as an American um, and as someone living in America or with the effects of America, but the question for me is like, we're only 11 months in. Uh, how are we gonna keep this up Good. for three more years? Good, let's pick that up in a couple of minutes. Theo? <laughs> <clears throat> when, when one of our postdocs was the first person on TV as, as, as he landed. And, okay. so, um, I'm, I'm the academic in the room, so... Um, so I give talks for a living, I guess. Is the, yeah. um, I, I, think, I think I'll start with the thing that surprises that, that, has, uh, that has changed about uh, and the, my, my perception that has changed through the years is that materials actually hide uh, an enormous amount of surprises. Uh, I'm a technologist by training. I used to work with lasers. Um, and now I run, I run a lab that has uh, scientists from all, from all disciplines architects, um, artists, Olympians, uh, and we all work around with the inspiration of taking nature's materials to build things. And uh, it's, uh, and so we use uh, silk uh, to, to build plastics, but plastics that are augmented. So think electronics that you can eat or uh, pieces of transparent material that contain a polio vaccine that doesn't need to be refrigerated, or an invisible edible coating that stores fruit without, without having to be refrigerated. So things that actually sort of bridge the divide between technology and biology and that have very profound, uh, very profound global implications, uh, I think, on manufacturing and on availability of therapies and on availability of food and that preserve also our our food supply chain. It's been sort of a magical journey for me because it was absolutely unexpected. Um, I really didn't work on silk before I joined Tufts. And uh, it speaks to the importance, I guess, of communication with other people and finding like-minded people that do want to leave an impact. And this, is, this goes to great kudos to my, my dear friend and colleague, David Kaplan, who is a tissue engineer that has worked on this material for longer than I have. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, uh, where are we going from here? Well, and the, uh, que and the question you have. <laughs> well, the question that I have is um, how to replace plastics. <laughs> how to replace plastics? You said that very quietly. I did. I, you need I did. How to replace plastics? How to replace plastics? That, there That's we are. my question. Okay. Good. Great, Rodrigo. Yes. So what I could add about about myself is that I I consider myself much more a creation of Elos than the creator of Elos. So I, I see myself as a better person, especially because of the people that I have around me at Allos that builds and do the work every day. I do part of the work, they do most of the work, I would say. And I think my work, it's mainly, despite my education on, in architecture, the, the, my work is mainly trusting in the human potential to do good things for themselves and to other human beings. So we work to spread a, a, a philosophy of transformation that relies on the human potential for cooperation within diversity. And more than that, uh, the potential to build the sense of community within diversity. And despite what we watch in, on the news every day, it is working, in my experience, it's working in, in more than 400 communities in 49 countries in the world. So is how far we, we, we got so till now. And what I know now that I, maybe I didn't know at the beginning is that it, it is possible to transform the world we live in into the world we dream of. 
they believe in this. And my question is how much time it will take and how we take care of those who are engaged in this mission, I would say. And I would say how we take care of all of us so we don't lose hope before we get there. Thank you, Rodrigo, very good. So, Bright, I'd like you to help Rebecca with her question of how do you sustain, because you've been in this game for quite some time. So how is Rebecca going to sustain over the long term with only 11 months into what looks like a Until long haul? Until I'm your age. <laughs> <laughs> so, when, I, when we first started, um, like I said, it was a lot of anger, and that was the drive, anger was the drive. Um, it's quite crazy that you walk into a pharmacy to buy medicine for your, your little child, and you stand one in three chance of getting something that could kill the child. And so anger was enough to get you going. The truth, though, is that anger is not enough over the medium term. And you have to find other values that are important. And it started off from, first of all, getting off this notion of being the center. You know, to my mind, and I think we discussed this at one point, leadership is really about creating other leaders. And when it becomes about other people's journey towards the same passion that you currently feel about the problem, you're able to be more objective, to stand outside, looking in, and that gives you renewed strength because as they go through the journey that you've gone through and you see them scale one handle after the other, it rejuvenates your, your passion. If it's just you in the center, then you're going to be worn out much, much, much quicker. So what I've found works in a decade of doing this work now, two things. One is very much how you live through others, how you find the journey that you've been through refracted through the lens of other people that are on the same journey and how that rejuvenates your energy. Mm -hmm. The second thing is also obviously the fact that we can't have just one course. No matter how passionate and how deep, um, deeply involved you are in a particular course, it helps to have some other courses as well. Mm -hmm. And that is why I have not only done this technology work um, um, to the exclusion of other work, but I have also been very politically involved because one counterbalances the other. And I find out that if you are able to work with at least two courses, then when there is a bit of a tailspin on the other one, the other one keeps you going. So those are the two things that I will advise. Juggling this is so, so hedge your bets. <laughs> hedge your bets as well. Find two courses. <coughs> at the, at the so you least. start with anger. I know, uh, I know, Rodrigo, you start with dreams. And I'm curious if you're advising uh, the development of next generation plastics, what would be the things that you would be saying or encouraging <laughs> with respect to dreams? dreams. Yes. Well. <laughs> I don't know, we are totally driven by dreams. So, uh, I mean, the, and we do, we, 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 we talk about it in opposition to, to the problem solve, solve in mind. So we, we, f we feel that we, we lose a lot of energy when you are all the time looking to the problem. It, it takes our energy away. So, I mean, Having like the most utop ut ut utopian dreams, I f for us is the best strategy. But to start with the small steps, so you can you can feel that it's possible. So we, we dream big, but we start small. So we start to to gain confidence that it's possible. If we if we go right away to the big dream, you get frustrated. So that's your that's your advice. What's your dream? To replace plastics with a low, with a with a high, with a high voice. Uh, that's like uh, that's, that's that's all. <laughs> no, but we've got to know why silkworms. I mean, this is something that went away in the Middle Ages, right? It, it, it is, they're but back. but they're back. They're yes. Back. No, nature has a way of building with 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 its own bricks, with its with structural proteins, and the things that are different is that these materials are variable, are living, and 
and have multiple functions. You can eat them, you can put them under your skin, they degrade when you tell them to degrade. Um, so so it's, it's really kind of a different, um, a different take on, uh, on materials. The, the opportunities, the opportunities, it's like taking chemistries and flavors and smells and giving them shape. So you kind of break the form and function of the object. And so you can really get to kind of utopian spaces. And I, I agree mm. fully that you need to think absolutely outside of the box, which is sort of like the reason why we have a lot of unusual people in our lab. But then you, you have to be very able to, um, to ride the middle and so to be able to reduce the pragmatics and to execute because otherwise you're stuck in a storytelling regime. And when I say, you know, when I, when I give a talk, because I'm an academic and that's what academics do, but when I give, when I give a talk and I say, um, eat your cell phone, or plant your cell phone, we actually ate a CCD camera that we made. I think it's, I'm okay. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure. How did it taste? Like nothing. Oh. It was, we, they, you just chase it with a lot of scotch. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Rebecca, one of the conversations we had early on, and I really challenged you on this, I said, really easy for you to be in a privileged position here in New York, working with refugees, how do you use that privilege? How do you think about that privilege? <clears throat> uh, I don't know if being in New York and working with refugees is a particularly <laughs> privileged position to be in right now, but I'll take the rest of the question. Uh, no, I mean, I, I started my project, and we still have project in the name because that's how we think of it uh, as a student at Yale Law School, and I have no illusion that I, I mean, maybe I could, if I were a better dreamer, maybe I'd have illusions about it. Uh, but, but no illusion that we would have had the success that we did as rapidly as we did without like the backing of that institution. Um, and of course, just like get, you know, we don't need to go into a spiel about sort of like the socioeconomic factors that make someone like more or less likely to get to go to Columbia or Yale or wherever else. Um, suffice to say that I think, you know, privilege is, isn't something you should front about. Like, I think it's not helpful if you have privilege. And I, I also did, I'm from California, and I will say that I did not know what privilege was until I got to, like, New England. And I was like, oh, this is what, like, money is. <laughs> um, but that's in a separate uh, aside. I mean, I just think that, like, you, you have to own that you have privilege and not try to front and also not try to victimize people with less privilege and then just think about, like, okay, I'm lucky I have all this privilege. Like, how do I, like, deploy it? to, I hate that this word has been co-opted, but to disrupt things, you know, as much as possible. With great privilege comes great responsibility. And you had a personal experience abroad that brought some light to that, I recall. Uh, I've had several personal experiences abroad. Um, I, I don't know which one, are you talking about Jordan or Zimbabwe? Yeah, Jordan? Jordan, okay, yeah. sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I was doing, I was doing an internship uh, the summer between my first and second years of law school and the upshot was that uh, the, the NGO didn't have enough for me to do. Um, and I have this OCD thing about wasting time and efficiency because like, let's face it, we're all gonna die pretty soon. Um, <laughs> so like, go for it, right? Is how, it, that's what motivates me. Mm. Um, I think that's the Obsession path. with my own mortality. I'm sh yep. I know that's new. Um, <laughs> and I, I got this idea, I just kept hearing about these Iraqi refugees in Jordan, and I got this idea that I should go meet some um, without any, I wasn't like, on. Oh, and then I'm going to start a project, and then someday I'm going to tell a bunch of really fancy people at the Italian Academy at Columbia about it. Um, but I just was really struck by the plight that people were in, and they mm. all just really seemed like they needed a good lawyer. Mm. True. Rodrigo. <laughs> Bright is challenged with corruption. Mm. You are living and working in Santos and having to find a way that people can dream and build their own houses. The first thing about architects is, aren't they the ones that are always telling people what to do, right? Isn't, how did you change that around and how do you deal with folks that are, get in your way? Uh, uh, first, we, reali we realized that people had better ideas than, than us for how their lives could be better. So this is like kind of arrogant, like uh, 
attitude for an architect. So we, we, we pretend that we know how people can live better, can have better lives in the buildings that we design. So, so we, we, we were amazed when we started to ask people uh, how they, they dream to live. They had wonderful ideas, one, wonderful solutions for their lives. And what, what is good about it is that when you follow like their solutions, it tends to, to work better because it, it's coming from them. So it's, uh, it tends to, to work much better. It tends to, to, to continue to, to be sustainable a long time also. And the, the issue about like corruption and politics and I don't know, we trust, we trust uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, in, the, in the human potential for doing good things. In to so, no matter who we are dealing with, it could be like a drug dealer in a, in a favela, Brazilian favela, or the mayor of the city. I mean, and we, we, we talk to that person looking for his or her potential of doing good things. And we are amazed uh, because we realize that all kinds of people that we are used to consider like bad people, people they, they, they still have the ability to do good things. We have received like cooperation from people that we call criminals. And they were doing that for free to support their community. I don't know. This, uh, I believe that human beings they have potential to do both things. Mm -hmm. We are not. We are not like. Uh, it's not like as, as some people say that it's, we are biologically or like we are, we are naturally like uh, evil. Like uh, we we do bad things because this is like our pre primitive instinct. We have mm -hmm. we have both, both potentials together. So it's how you stimulate people. So which, which, which one of the potentials do you want to stimulate? Thank you. And, and maybe just a, a last question, and we'll, we'll ask for uh, questions on the mics. But for our two technologists, there's a lot of discussion about technology as being quite autonomous now. Uh, it's, it's something, can we control it? Is it something that, how do we relate it back to human endeavors and the ways that humans are going to make choices about the future? and is the genie out of the bottle? Can I add a question to that? Please. How long until the singularity? There we are. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I take my, my, my inspiration from, um, um, you know, the famous philosopher Michael Polanyi. And, you know, he said a lot of great things, uh, you know, um, in politics. But his insight that there are aspects of the way we think that are not codifiable is very interesting. Because it has implications for a lot of the ways in which we look at the, how technology evolves globally, at a global scale. He makes the argument that because it is not everything we think that we can say, it also means that not all the rules are specifiable. We've had a great um, discussion this afternoon about machine learning and whether machine learning can provide a way out of that. Obviously, what machine learning cannot provide a way out of is giving my technology purpose because that discovery itself is contested. So even if you could say, look, we're not gonna set up the rules, they're gonna learn and they're gonna evolve, you still have to contend with this issue of purpose, with this issue of meaning, and whether, as a society, we can leave that to try and error, and how much risk we're willing to bear. So from a, you know, your question around the singularity, I, I strongly believe that the most important contribution that technology can make is enhancing human ability to collaborate with each other. If we take that point, then it seems to me that total autonomy uh, for machines is not something that we have the means and the tools to comprehend at this point. And therefore, there is going to be a movement um, of people, an active agency on the part of people to bring back the technology genie into the bottle. I see, I see that happening. Mm -hmm. And that one area where it's very evident already mm -hmm. is this issue around permissionless or zero trust based right. systems, particularly blockchain. Right. It's already evident that we are sold a lie, that you can't have a permissionless system or a trust based, a system that is not based on trust at all. Mm. It's quite evident now that mm. 
unless we're all going to become cryptographic mathematicians, you're going to have to rely on somebody to use the blockchain. Right. And that requires trust. Right. So I think that is a great example of how sometimes the vision that is promoted um, is not always in alignment with the reality in the way that technology evolves. It's embedded. I go back to Polanyi. Yeah. It's embedded. And I think because it's embedded, culture in the end wins. Theo, can you add to that? Well, I think no, I, it's very difficult. To, I, I think as a, as, a, as a famous diplomat once said, I, I, guess, I guess I am. Uh, I am a worried optimist about, about these things <laughs> as, 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 as well. I think, um, I think ultimately, um, I think ultimately there is a there is a pace of evolution of technology right now, and um, uh, and of uh, introduction of new uh, of new engagement modes at the, at the technical level that we might not even know how to frame the problem yet. And to a certain extent, we always think of AI as a as a global, uh, as, as, as something that has global impact, but it may very well be personalized and inter, interconnected within, within very, very useful domains. So, um, so, and by that I mean that artificial intelligence can augment the human in very, uh, in very efficient ways and then guide, guide the human relationship on a, on a personal basis that then builds right. up, builds right. up the so, uh, global connectivity. A similar perspective, so. yeah. So we can take some questions. Please just jump to the mics. We'd like to hear your name if we could and Hi, where you're coming uh, from. My name is Henry Nass. Uh, this is a question for the silk uh, worm related person. Uh, That's for you. I, I wanted to know, is there a connection between silk and spider web material? Uh, uh, yeah, so, so is there a connection between silk and spider web materials? The, the, anything, the definition, the biological definition of silks is very broad. And it's anything that an organism produces outside with with uh, with a production system outside of its uh, outside of its own body. So, for example, even mussels produce a certain form of silk. Spider spider silk is very is very nice. We but you have much less of that uh, because spiders tend to be cannibalistic, and uh, silkworm silk is much more available. It's a commodity textile material, so that's why we use it, and it has a lot of the same sort of. And nice. Theo's into silk. Well, are are you looking good. to synthesize both or only depend on the animal resource? He has some spiders to sell. So, uh, <laughs> so, so there are efforts, actually, industrial efforts right now in, in that marry synthetic biology and material production. So there are at least four companies that I can think of that are synthesizing okay. spider silk. I want to go back to the question on leadership. Uh, please, next, in your name, please. Hi, my name is Noah. Um, my question is for all of the four panelists before us. Um, we have a minute left. <laughs> and it's, it's I'll, I'll try to be brief. It seems to me that the sort of mission um, of Talberg and the mission of, um, of Columbia um, is sort of a paradoxical one, and that is to institutionalize progress. It seems to be something that you four are trying to do um, in sort of disparate fields. Um, and it's uh, a mission which is tiring. Um, mm -hmm. As uh, Rebecca sort of pointed out, she said she's tired. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the institutions that work are also very tired, as she pointed and out. Your, your question, please? My, my question is, what are the um, institutions that you are trying to change in the fields in which you're working in? Mm. And how do you intend to make your missions, your projects, your initiatives, um, institutions of progress? How do you ensure that they are going to continue to change? So institutions, you are changing through the work you're doing I very quickly. I, I think the biggest weakness in the global model for problem solving right now is that local innovators who are closest to the problems are not getting global amplification. That is the biggest problem. Yeah. The people that are close to the problems really know what the problem is. Somehow, some of the solutions can only really make sense if they operate at global scale. And there's no connection between the two. Excellent. Any other reflections on that? I just think that part of it is not ever thinking that you've arrived at the solution. 
and, and continuing, like whatever you're doing and whatever institution you're trying to change or, or tear down or whatever your relationship to institution is, mm -hmm. like you have to just constantly iterate your thinking about it and mm -hmm. say, how can I do this better? And how do you deal with this, this definition of progress? How's that? Are you, is that for, yeah. I assume yeah. you want all four yeah. of us no. to get in. Yeah. But. I understand that well. Well, just he's, he's saying that we may be purveying a certain kind of progress. This is what, what, what are we doing institutionally which shifts the, the paradigm of that? Mm. I mean, I mean I, I've been working with many institutions, but I, what I do believe is that we can transform people. People make institutions. So these institutions are made of people. So I, I can't believe we can change institutions. Like that's from my point of view, but we, we, we can change people and people yep. can change institutions. Please, question. Um, hello, my name is Annie. Um, and my question is, how are you engaging the media to, to be able to disseminate your information and your technology and the work that you do to like a wide audience, but not have the media like warp what you're doing um, because I, the media has like the power to either like put you on a pedestal or just like rip you apart, yep. um, and I think it's especially important in this kind of political climate. So just and any like major strategies you guys have been doing, or like major. I think the question issues? is what works. I mean, one of the reasons that we're all here tonight is is really to take this up to another level in terms of visibility and understanding. Uh, I'm hoping that you'll be tweeting the minute you get away from the microphone and that other people will be. So there's something that we can all do to say, let's put folks like this in the headlines rather than other leaders that we really have got grown tired of seeing in the headlines. And, and this is really a part of it. But what are, are there concrete things that that is giving I, you a media I, franchise? I think media like, does like a terrible work <laughs> I, almost against what we are say, what, what we are doing because media every day is telling people to lose hope, basically, every day, the whole day. If you watch the news, so if you have an idea on how to engage media on promoting good things in the world, I would love to hear also. I yeah. guess because yeah. I, 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 it's something that really yeah. I don't know bothers me. It's yeah. I mean, one thing though is that we used to think of globalization as the compression of time and space, but nowadays about the compression of ideas. Right. And so it's Twitter, it's TED Talks, it's things like that. I think what we have to do is get better at compressing our ideas because yeah. otherwise it's not going to get a transmission. You can't keep on having, you know, general length inter interactions with the rest of the world and still hope to get your message through. Yeah. So what we have to train better is how do we compress our ideas and get it transmitted? Good. And we have one minute to do that. Okay. Uh, one more um, question. Hello. My name is Allegra. And... My question is, uh, in the introductions and in your speeches as well, we touched a lot about um, cross-disciplinary and cross-cultural communication in terms of like developing your projects. And I was just wondering, what, um, how have you ensured that this kind of communication happened, or perhaps what difficulties did you face in ensuring that? Now, how did you get your message across, across cultures? Uh, maybe any, anyone. Well, uh, Cross cultures. Yeah. Or even across disciplines. Across sectors, across... Yeah. yeah. So I didn't understand it fully. I think, oh. I think it was. I, yeah. But my, my, personal, my personal experience is, uh, is that there is a global... There, there is sort of a global impact that is visible and that, that is, the, is, the end, is, the, is the end goal that I think everybody shares. And it's not too much about the person that is making the optical gadget, the person that is doing the electronics, the person that is, you know, 3D printing. It's really about the fact that ultimately, ultimately there is this shared vision that this will do something that can change the status quo in materials, in medicine, in, mm. in global health or, or whatever. And it's a human connection. And so the, it's very unusual. You tend to try to to match light, it's people first. You tend to match like-minded people and the discipline almost becomes secondary because generally when there is that, that sort of flame mm. inside, then, uh, then, then the communication and pragmatism happen naturally. And we see that this week. I think we have to come to an end. Um, can we just hear the questions, the last two questions, because I've, you've been standing in line for... <laughs> Ten minutes waiting. Just your questions. Uh, my name is Joseph. I have a question for um, Bright Simmons. So, in a place like Nigeria, if <laughs> um, my if, favorite market, <laughs> right? So, um, I'm a native of Nigeria. So, I'm saying if 
there's a single payer system and if you have the government just handle the drugs, do you think that perhaps that would eliminate all of the different avenues in which you know, fake drugs can be put into the market? And can we take this offline? That sounds like a kind no. of technical I question. You solve the problem entirely. Okay, and I'll explain to you after. Okay. 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 And the last question you had standing in your name. Hi, yeah. um, my name's Kareem. Thank you guys so much for your talk. This is mainly for Bright um, and uh, Rebecca, but essentially my question is: both of you are pursuing social ventures, and I feel like a lot of the time when one pursues a social venture in order to like raise funding or raise awareness or get people to be interested in the product that the venture is trying to solve or the issue that the venture is trying to solve, it takes, there's a certain like, one must be able to convince other people to care about others. As in, it, it's, it's very easy for like people to get caught up in their own problems. Right. Like I'm a Columbia student, I've got classes, exams, I've got my own issues right. to attend to. The question is how do we convince people? How do we convince other people to care, essentially, is my question. The movement is your product. Sorry? Your first product is the movement. Right. So as a social venture, you need to build a movement first before you build a product. Right. Oh, I disagree. I think it's about individual stories. I think, you could, I think that, that empowering people to speak with their own voices about their own issues is, is the way to generate compassion and empathy and to mobilize people to care about something. OK. Two different views. And that really shows that we have a, a range of perspectives tonight. Um, right. Keep in mind that these folks have really been selected, again, for more than 200 people, because they have something that they're able to do which shifts on an institutional level, that changes relationships and builds ecologies of connections, and that they're constantly, and I noticed this even today, they're working on them themselves, their own narratives, the way that they're framing and thinking about their work. So there's a, there's a lot of effective practice and there's a lot of, of feedback that they're willing to take. And they're all good listeners as well as talkers. So thank all of you for joining this evening. And thank you to Ta Columbia University. Thank you. Good. So uh, let me just say that those of you who thank want you. to have further discussion, especially if you're undergraduates and graduates, there are workshops tomorrow. They're filled up, but if you really want to go, go to the Committee on Global Thought website and we'll try to accommodate you. So thank you all for coming. Conversation continues. Thank you. Thank you.